Welcome to Act and Unwind, an ongoing conversation on a free and virtuous society. I'm your host, Eric Cohn. Thank you for listening, and I want to ask that if you're listening to us on our website, that you navigate now to the show notes for this episode, where you will find a link to subscribe directly to Act and Unwind at Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or anywhere else where you listen to find podcasts. And if you like this program, please leave us a five-star review at Apple Podcasts so as to help more people find our show. This week, I'm joined by Dan Huger, Acton's librarian and a research associate, and Dylan Palman, executive editor of the Journal of Markets and Morality and a research fellow here at Acton. This week, we'll discuss a new study on the lack of ideological diversity on elite college campuses. But first, I want to go to the streets of Tehran, where we're now entering the fifth week of Iranian protests that were sparked by the death of a 22-year-old Masha Amini, um, who uh, it was for wearing improperly wearing a, uh, a head covering, which is what started this. And we're five weeks into this now. At least 233 people have died in these demonstrations, and that's according to a uh, um, human rights activist news agency, including 32 children. This seems like a a big story, and it just to me does not seem to be all that prominent. Now there is a lot going on in the world, and last week you uh, this program discussed uh, while I was not here the nuclear threats from Vladimir Putin. The war in Ukraine is still going on. Um, another big story from. Uh, the last several days, uh, that uh, Chinese Communist Party leader Xi Jinping uh, gave this big speech, and he is about to uh, break with precedent. Uh, communists love their precedent uh, in awarding himself a third five-year term as the General Secretary of the CCP. There's a lot going on, and yet it seems even this nuclear power country is, or desirous to be a nuclear power country. May, we don't believe they have the bomb yet, but they've been working on it. Uh, there's a lot of commotion in the streets, and it doesn't seem like we're talking about it all that much. Why do you think that is? I think one of the reasons is since 2017, there have been a lot of protests in Iran over water shortages, over energy shortages, periodic brownouts. Um, <clears throat> while this particular case with hijab and head coverings is different in that there's a different sort of catalyzing event. Um, there's been a long simmering discontent among the Iranian people with their government. And one of the sort of tragedies is that the government has responded to each in turn with a sort of brutality that's really unimaginable for us in the developed world. Um, so in a sense, this is a new story, but in a sense, this is also an old story in which, you know, nothing, the sort of changes that one would hope to see sparked by such protests were never realized in the past. So I think that's one of the reasons it's failed to capture um, the imaginations of, of the folks in the news cycle. However, these protests are getting substantially more attention than those previous ones because this is involved with a very sort of easily identifiable human rights issue. This is also an issue that affects women in Iran. So there are different communities that have mobilized to spread awareness of these, of these recent protests. But I think, I think in the end, why, why the story hasn't caught fire um, although an Iranian prison did, uh, I think uh, two days ago now, um, is that <clears throat> we haven't really seen any developments beyond the brutality, um, which is which is sad. Uh, I mean, my theory, just more off the top of my head, uh, is there is a categorical difference between Russia invading Ukraine, one sovereign nation invading another. And civil unrest. Um, now, it's not to say this is, you know, the lives lost are any more or less important in either one. Uh, but I think uh, from a Western media point of view, uh, Ukraine, although not a member of NATO, not, you know, there, there's all sorts of complications there. Uh, Ukraine is viewed as the West and the West has been invaded. Um, at least that's that's kind of the the rhetoric that certainly where a lot of the support is coming from, uh, from other Western nations uh, to Ukraine, whereas 
Iran has not really ever been on very friendly terms with us in my lifetime. Um, and even recently, uh, we've had some scuffles, uh, right? Uh, so uh, I think until this is, you know, if uh, one of our allies in the region is suddenly threatened because they're, you know, the Khomeini is lashing out and trying to annex territory. That's a very different story. So I, I think I think this should be covered. I, I think these sorts of stories um, can be very important. Um, I mean, just witness the previous Iranian revolution uh, that made a very big difference on the world stage. Um, so I don't I don't think it's it's minor at all. And I think it absolutely does deserve more, you know, I'm tr trying not to use like outmoded metaphors or, you know, like headline space or whatever. We, we have the internet. Column now. inches. Um, yeah, right. Exactly. Pixels. Um, you know, front page news. Yeah. Um, but, uh, but you know what I mean? Um, it's something that should, should get more attention. Um, and it's very interesting as, as Dan said, you know, so there's been lots of unrest of various sorts for various reasons for, you know, what, I don't know, five years now. Um, this one is caused by, a uh, young woman who was arrested because, uh, you know, improper wearing of hijab or head covering. Um, and she was in police custody and she dies. And they claim it was a heart attack. Now, a 22-year-old dying of a heart attack uh, is very rare and would require some kind of, you know, pre-existing conditions. The family is denied uh, that any such uh, heart problems were the case. Um, so it looks really, really, really fishy, uh, <laughs> to put you, it you simply. You think they could contrive um, a better lie. Than right. Um, so, yeah, that's that's really bad. Um, and it hasn't stopped, right? They Week after week now, uh, it's been getting worse. It's more and more cities, especially um, uh, Kurdish uh, you know, territories, but not limited to that at all. And people are chanting things like death to the dictator and death to Khomeini. I mean, this is... This is pretty serious revolutionary sort of language. Doesn't mean there's a real revolution happening, but um, it is interesting. I think there's something about even the most brutal dictatorships are underneath very fragile things. Uh, they, you know, I come back to to the economist Kenneth Boulding all the time. But a threat system is all the more fragile the more often you have to carry out a threat. Um, and when you're constantly brutally suppressing protests within your own nation, it just completely undermines the legitimacy of the state. It reminds me of this line that I heard about China that I like this analogy that you can think of regimes like that as being like marble. They're very strong, but they're also very brittle. There's not a lot of flexibility there. And as a result, when I've talked about the the Hong Kongers, I've taken that film around the country and people ask about, you know, the state of China before giving the disclosure that I am far from an expert on China and I'm relying on um, the you know, in, in many ways on the work and the thoughts of people much, much more attuned to that than I am. Um, we, you know, we talk about the economic liberalization that, that happened there, the idea of opening up trade with China, uh, that it was going to make China more politically liberal while it made it more economically liberal. And, you know, people always say, well, it didn't work. It didn't work yet. Um, we, we really have... I th you could look back at the collapse of the Soviet Union that these, uh, in, in the words of uh, Hemingway in The Sun Also Rises, about going bankrupt, right? Well, how does it happen? Very slowly and then all of a sudden. Um, there are plenty of people who did not think the Soviet Union would collapse in the way the Soviet Union did. So it's, it is you know, very hard to make predictions, especially about the future. So we don't know what is going to happen here in Iran. Uh, but what I thought is interesting here is I see um, – uh, this quote from uh, labeling the United States as the great Satan, Iranian President uh, Ibrahim Rassi. I, I apologize if I'm mispronouncing that. Uh, blamed President Joe Biden for inciting the, quote, chaos, terror, and destruction in Iran. I remember this line of argument from the Green Revolution that the United States, the people, critics who thought the United States did not do enough to embrace the people who were protesting during the Green Revolution that was, of course, eventually put down. Well, they're already attributing, you know, this to the president of the United States, that the United States is encouraging all of this. And that was a, a, a rhetorical line that was going to be taken regardless of whether there's any truth to it or not. So I think it, it raises the question, is it appropriate? Should the United States want to encourage anything like this? I mean, we have 
No idea if this regime is teared down, what comes in to replace it. But at least one line of argument would say it's probably not going to be as problematic to the region, specifically to Israel, really to the world, as the current Iranian regime. It, was that a – would that be – should we engage in that kind of in, open encouragement of what's going on in Iran right now? I mean, I think you always have to <clears throat> stand up for people's rights to demonstrate, for people's rights to uh, petition, redress their governments. That's something different than, let's say, uh, you know, uh, plotting a coup or something like that, or or taking positive steps to destabilize a country. And I think I think that there's a very important. Um, distinction there. And what I've seen from the Biden administration and what I've seen from recent administrations are efforts to engage Iran diplomatically while supporting human rights in Iran. And I think I think both of those things uh, should be pursued. I think that um, there are many bad actors in the world that nonetheless you have to engage with in order to promote a better, more stable world. At the same time, I think it's wrong to just simply, you know, retreat to a, a sort of bare realpolitik of, all right, we just want to go along to get along. And I think, I think threading that needle of being supportive of the human rights of all people, while at the same time trying to engage uh, these various states productively and to bring them along that way, um, I, I think should be encouraged. When And it's also, it's very, very hard for us to judge. And this goes back to, you know, the, the riddle of the column inches or why is this not being covered? There is not a robust Western press in Iran reporting on this. Uh, you have similar challenges in China. Um, what you don't have, and one of the other ways that the Ukrainian conflict is different, is you have in the Ukrainian government a very Western-facing government that encourages press coverage of the conflict, that invites reporters in to report on and see for themselves what's going on. Um, and when, when that level of transparency doesn't exist, that also gives – regimes sort of fertile ground to spin these sort of conspiracy theories of, you know, when you don't have Western reporters talking to folks on the ground who are able to tell their own story of why they're doing this without fear of police brutality or repercussions for their families, um, you don't get that story told. And what you get in that vacuum is instead these sort of conspiracy theories peddled uh, by by governments trying to justify their own brutality. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> you know, a, a key difference along those lines, Ukraine has asked for help from the West. Um, and I realize it's not always possible, but it probably would be a good policy to say, we're going to wait for people to ask for our help before we start meddling in a way that could destabilize uh, a region. It's not to say that I think the current regime in Iran is a good thing, um, but we have been meddling in Syria, for example. Um, this is a case where, like, sometimes the CIA does meddle. <laughs> like, this is unfortunately true. Um, that's why people like Khomeini can use it as an excuse um, is – been supporting groups there that turn out to be the Taliban or, you know, and there's, there's, well, that this there's is always instances like the, where it's like, I, I wish we just would take a step back and say this, this unfortunately is awful, but it's none of our business. Um, now, I don't. In Syria in particular, I always like that if you recall this period of time where I remember it was mostly coming from Senator John McCain, the talk about supporting the moderate rebels, right? And it was like, it's always this. Who exactly are yeah, these how do, moderate how do we rebels? Determine in that? There? How do we know? You know, it's different when Zelensky is talking to Congress asking for help. Yes. I mean, there's just a categorical difference there. And it doesn't mean that I mean, people can have differing views on that as well. Um, and, and 
for, despite what I said, it doesn't mean we should be indifferent, but I think things like dis- diplomacy, I think things like offering to be, you know, uh, mediator, say, look, if you want our help to sit down and talk diplomatically rather than shooting at each other, we're happy to be a resource for, you know, like there are ways we can offer to help even when no one's asking that is not uh, smuggling arms into the country <laughs> and and extending a violent conflict. Um, I you know unless we are going to commit all the way, I think we we saw the problem with this even in uh, instances where we had public support, such as the war in Afghanistan. Um, we were not willing ultimately to do what it would take to finish the job there, and we left, and it was a disaster. Um, and I think if we're going to be involved, we need to commit and we need to do it right um, or not do it at all. I want to come back to Dan had mentioned negotiating with uh, regimes like this and also bring it back a bit to what was discussed last week with the threats of uh, the use of nuclear weapons from Vladimir Putin. Um, I think in that sense – Uh, The question I want to raise uh, is clearer in the Ukraine and Russia example than it is right now with Iran because there was this – there were a lot of problems with the Iran nuclear deal, um, whether or not that you thought it was a worthy course of action to have been pursued. And even if I think you were generally in support of it, it speaks to some of our – institutional problems that exist right now, that essentially this was an international treaty that they refused to have ratified as – a international treaty in part because they knew that it wouldn't be ratified. Um, And as a result, you get with the Iran deal, similar to a lot of things that are done by presidents now, that they're done by executive action, and the next president comes in of the other party and immediately throws a lot of that stuff out, and you create this massive regime uncertainty, or in, in a weird way, this regime certainty that you know things are going to change, that nothing is going to be permanent, that nothing is going to last. It's just going to be changed really quickly like that. But again, move back to Russia and Ukraine. And the question of whether the United States should attempt to pressure Ukraine and facilitate a dialogue between them and Russia to settle the war that is going on there right now. And from the humanitarian side, I understand that. Um, I don't want to see one more person die in this incredibly senseless conflict. From the point of view of wanting to avoid getting to the point where tactical nuclear weapons might be used, I also understand that. The problem, as I see it, is essentially the only way that uh, we get this settled, if we get both parties to the table and they work out some kind of an agreement, this rewards Russia for what it did. They're going to get part of the country. They're going to get a way out of this that saves face somewhat in a war that I, I think you could quite credibly make the argument right now that they are losing. Um, it is brutal in a lot of ways, but it certainly has not gone the way that Vladimir Putin thought that it was going to go. And I would said to Dan before the program, part of the problem there is, you know, it's never just the Sudetenland. Um, if you're willing to be like, okay, this, but no further. Okay, this, but no further. We have plenties, plenty of examples from history of cases where that just does not work out with people like Vladimir Putin. It didn't work out with Hitler. Um, and I don't see the reason to believe that it will work out with Vladimir Putin. So on one hand, you have the potential good of ending this bloody conflict. But at the cost of essentially rewarding what Russia chose to do here and launch a aggressive war to take territory from a sovereign nation, how do we meet out the different parts of that in play? I mean, if you look at it, you've had conflict in – Ukraine and the Donbass uh, and other uh, eastern regions since 2014 uh, has been very messy on both sides. Um, it's not a simple matter of Russia bad guys, Ukraine good guys. Not to say that I think it's I, – I don't at all think it's a good thing that Russia attacked Ukraine. Um, I support their sovereignty and their right to exist. Um, but this has been a mess. Um, so this is this is a much longer history than February. Um 
this happened uh, right at the time that Ukraine inaugurated a more Western-facing government, said they wanted to join NATO. You can't join NATO if you have a border dispute. So now they had a border dispute. Russia may have started that border dispute. Uh, they certainly encouraged it and supported it. Um, I look at it as it should at least be on the table. It should be something that you talk about in terms of, well, this is bad, uh, but the only way you're going to be able to regroup, rebuild Ukraine, which is, you know, mainland, you know, Kiev is getting pummeled, right? The only way you're going to have any way to fully support them is if they can join NATO, right? Unfortunately, that's at this point a, a very bad deal either way, but I, how does it get better? If, if they say, no, we're not going to relinquish this territory, I, and I fully understand. They're like, this is Ukraine. We're not, we're, you know, I completely get that. Um, but they're also just not getting, the, even though they're getting a ton of arms and that sort of thing, they're not getting, it's not like NATO troops are there. They're not. Um, that is not the scale at which this war is being fought. Um, so they're holding out. But look at, and, you know, I point this out to people. Yes, Russia went for Kiev. I think they went for Kiev because they were like right in February. They're like, well, if we can take it, we'll take it. Right. But the stated goal of Putin at the time was to liberate the Donbass and Luhansk. Um, and if anything, they're doing better than that. <laughs> right. There's two southern territories as well that had these sham elections and, you know, were voted to be annexed by Russia. Um, I don't look at this as Russia losing this war. I think that's actually a bad take on what's happening. I think Russia was not able to do as much as they hoped. In that sense, you could say, well, you know, look at look at how well the Ukrainians have done. Certainly, we should congratulate them for that. Um, but this has been bad for them. And it's been mostly good for Russia, I think. I think it's been bad internally for Russia. You know, it's, all, it's, it's messy again. But, um, but I look at just actual territory um, and advancement. It looks like a mission accomplished, unfortunately, uh, from a Russian perspective. Your, your point there is well taken. I, I'd say certain, at minimum what I would say is at much higher cost than was envisioned when this whole thing was started. Sure. So... <clears throat> there's there's a third option that I think is is the most likely option at this point between you know Ukraine regains all of its all of its territories that have been taken it resides in its internationally recognized boundaries and has sovereignty over all of that Russia withdraws um that's an option there is an option of of total Russian victory, which I think I think Eric is right. I think that that at this point has passed. But what you do have is the potential for a frozen conflict, and these are things that Russia has engaged in for literally generations. At this point, we look, you know, Moldova has never been sovereign over all of its territory since you know ninety eighty nine ninety when it when it broke off. You look at Georgia and Abkhazia and South Ossetia and the situation down there. Georgia has never been sovereign over all of its territory. If they have – each of them have internationally recognized boundaries. Um, those boundaries are not respected and Russia is instrumental in both of those cases. Um, you know, Frank Herbert, the science fiction novelist, has this has this this haunting line in Dune Messiah where he says, "There are problems in the universe for which there are no answers. Nothing, nothing can be done." And that is the way that I'm increasingly looking at this Ukrainian conflict. I think it's right to give aid to the Ukraine to defend its sovereign territory, but I think the notion of 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 any sort of return to uh, you know, uh, its territorial integrity before 2014, let alone what it is now, is looking sort of increasingly unlikely. Now, there there is one, you know, outside chance for that to change, and that would be a destabilized Russia and a sort of a sort of you know collapse of of you know Vladimir Putin's regime. That itself presents its own 
challenges and potentially devastating uh, consequences on the international stage. So it's 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 a it's a it's a sticky and, and persistent international conflict and has been since since 2014. And I don't see that changing anytime soon. To bring this back to Iran. Um which I appreciate because I realize we kind of engaged in our own version okay. of the uh, qu- first question I asked is, why is Iran not getting more attention? And then we just spent a good amount of yeah. time discussing well, Russia and Ukraine. So, but. but in a case where all of the options are bad options in terms of at least, at least in terms of U.S. involvement, um, it is good to remember that no matter how bad things are, they can always be worse. Which I realize sounds like a very pessimistic thing to say, but it is a good precautionary principle um, the the uh, Vladimir Putin's party is by far the largest party, not in any way through fair means, uh, but largest party in Russia. You know what the second largest political party in Russia is? The Communist Party, right? <laughs> Things were worse under communism. As terrible as Va- Vladimir Putin is, things were worse under communism. Um, so yes, it, we we know it can be worse there. It has been. Um, so and in Iran, yeah, the people protesting seem to want a more liberal country. Doesn't mean that they're going to be the people in charge if a revolution happens. Could be somebody way worse. Um, and there is a huge cost to using our power to destabilize a region, again, without any commitment to what it would take to genuinely follow through and set people up for success rather than simply obliterating terrible though they may be, the institutions the society has. So the the takeaway then is, yes, Russia may be an authoritarian kleptocracy, but at least it's not communist. Yeah, frankly. I, I mean, I, I, fair point. I, fair point. I, I'm not saying the former is a good thing, <laughs> yeah. but there are differing degrees of bad. I, you know, I tell people sometimes with relation to your point about trade in China, um, I agree. China, there's all kinds of human rights concerns. We probably should be at least we should at least reconsider some of our uh, relationship with them. However, I would rather live in Beijing than Pyongyang any day. Why? Because China has been open to the world. And they at least have to fake it, right? <laughs> There's some minimum level of decency that they have to treat their citizens, as terrible as they in fact do treat many of their citizens, uh, that far excels North Korea. Is from what we know of it, because we can know very little of North Korea. Um, so, yes, there there is always a worse. Um, and it's important to ask the question, will the thing we do, well-intended though it may be, actually produce a better outcome for the people there? Or will it be worse? I think, I think this is a good point, and it highlights what I find annoying about a lot of the consternation about these circumstances is because a lot of people seem to want to pretend as if there is clear choices between a good thing and a bad thing at play when, you know, all the hard decisions in life are between two good things or two bad things because the choice between a good and a bad thing is not a choice at all. Uh, and I think your point is incredibly well taken that, yes, you know, there's – Various forms of bad we have to choose from, <clears throat> and that requires deep thought and prudence in how we approach those kinds of problems. But at least we should recognize that there are various bad outcomes, and we want to look for the, you know, the one that is uh, closest to um, best that we can find. So, so to give a little hope. One of the things that all societies need to be, to be free and virtuous societies, are a robust set of institutions. And many of these societies we're talking about, be it Russia, be it China, be it Iran, do not have those institutions. How those institutions get built, however, are through things like these protests in Iran, where people who have a better vision for their country are able to to come together form networks. Um, And it does not look good for them right now. I mean, Eric pointed out there's been a terrible loss of life. But there is also a ray of hope to this and that people are coordinating. People are laying the groundwork for hopefully what maybe not next year, maybe not the year after that, but at some point in the future, 
if there is going to be a free and democratic Russia, Iran, uh, China, we need those people who will stand up and begin to pour in um, that energy into coordinating and speaking for an alternative and networking with each other. Um, this is why Hong Kong is so tragic because you had a system in China that had rule of law, that had all of these things we want, that pro provided, and this is why it was a threat to the Chinese regime, is that it proved there was a model for things could be different in China because in one part of China they were. Um, and it's, it's, it's immensely important that, you know, Questions of material support are prudential questions, but questions of moral support and solidarity with people opposing these regimes, that's not complicated and that's essential. It shouldn't be complicated and yet it does seem to be uh, very hard for some people to offer those kinds of statements of moral support. You just brought up Hong Kong and you know, immediately I think of one of my frustrations – uh, the recent arrest of Cardinal Zen in Hong Kong and the response from the Vatican is essentially a we are watching with deep concern what is happening and all of that when it should just not be hard at all to say that what happened there is unacceptable. But in, this speaks to I'm going to go making a point about building institutions, the point of institutions that they're supposed to do something, they're supposed to accomplish something, this kind of hollowed out institutions that we have in this modern world where they don't really seem to serve their function anymore. Uh, I, I think you see an example of that. The, the institutional pressures as they are preclude Pope Francis from being able to just clearly state that the arrest of a Catholic cardinal in Hong Kong is unacceptable. It should not be hard to do. It, to at least morally condemn things that are morally condemnable shouldn't be a reach, but sadly, and for too many people, it seems like it is a reach for them. I want to move on to uh, our second topic, which uh, I'll credit the, uh, the dispatch where I found uh, this study from the Center for the Study of Partisanship and Ideology, <clears throat> where it takes a look at the political demography of American elite students. So these are students on elite college campuses. I think there are some interesting things that stand out here, and I want to explore some of the implications of this. Uh, so I'll give you some of the highlights here, and we'll put the study in, in the show notes as well. Uh, America's elite university students are more demographically diverse than the general population, but more politically divided along lines of race, gender, sexuality, and religion. A minority and female students are far more liberal on campus than in the general population, whereas straight white Christian men are somewhat more conservative on campus than the general population. Uh, a quarter of students are LGBT, and there are roughly equal shares of Christian and non-religious students. Uh, LG, LGBT, non-religious, and Christian uh, Christians are set to become more important political groups among America's future leaders. Liberal arts colleges are the least politically diverse. Uh, some interesting ones about uh, religion here as well. Self-identified Jews make up only 3% of elite students and just 7% of Ivy League students, uh, suggesting a considerable decline since the early 2000s. Um, so I, I find this fascinating because in a way it's not surprising. Um, but the, the one that stands out to me is – a quarter of students at these elite universities identify as LGBT, which is so disproportionately unrepresentative from the population at large. Uh, the lack of religious representation on these campuses, I think, is also stands out to me. And what I wonder about, and I invite you to share your thoughts on, because these elite institutions, these elite schools – are the places from which a lot of the elite institutions that we were just talking about that have a lot of these moral failings and the hollowing out problem, the Yuval Levin platform problem that we've talked about in this program numerous times, this is where they're going to draw from for future leadership. And it is one that is dramatically disconnected. It, it is a bubble inside of a bubble from the rest of the world. And it would seem to 
preface, to, to, to lead to the kind of divide that exists between elite culture, you know, the Charles Murray coming apart argument, and kind of regular middle America culture just continuing to get wider and wider and wider. I mean, I think there was – I had a lot of thoughts on this. Uh, one was just there's a selection bias. So there's this common notion that, oh, well, you know, the more educated people get, the more progressive they become. Sounds like they're starting progressive in the first place and then they're getting an education. Um, so that would be a, you know, chicken or the egg sort of thing. But I think you can pretty well identify that there, you have a bunch of people – already predisposed one way and then their priors are just being confirmed. Yeah, the, the uh, brainwashing the, the brainwashing argument that some people make I always thought was overmade that it, it and again from even my own observations which are now almost 20 years removed from uh, being truly relevant is that you just it's it these priors are being confirmed on a regular basis which is why I always, you know, the people that I knew that were on the right on college campuses um, I always found to be just much better at being able to defend where they're coming from in an argument because they'd spent four years being challenged constantly on what they believe. Yeah. As opposed to having four years of just being it constantly affirmed to you that, you know, yes, you you are you are truly righteous. Right. Right. So I mean you look at the the conservative Christians apparently generally stay conservative Christian. You know, so that on the one hand there's there's maybe less to worry about. Now I, I say that you know, I understand there's some real problems in terms of free speech and things like that on college campuses, but uh, maybe don't worry so much about, oh, should my, you know, conservative Christian child go to the university or the elite school in particular? Um, seems like they have a good community there. <laughs> I mean, that weirdly, that's one of the takeaways, I think. Um, there are There is some disproportionate representation, as you mentioned. Um, 25% of the U.S. population is not LGBT. Um, but also like 75% of the U.S. population is not progressive <laughs> politically. I mean, that, there's another pretty big uh, skew there. Um, so you can look at it and I, there probably is some likelihood, a greater likelihood that someone goes to one of these schools, they end up, uh, you know, in a federal department or, you know, some kind of congressional staffer or something like that. So, yes. On the other hand, I guess... Maybe I just don't care enough <laughs> at the end of the day. I think there's always an elite and it's always going to be somewhat alienated from the general population. Um, say what you want about the 1619 Project. Uh, it certainly is accurate to say uh, there weren't a lot of black women at the Congressional Congress. In fact, there were zero, right? Um, they were not being represented. There was a big distance <laughs> between the people who were there and some very important people in our country. Um and that's always the case. That doesn't mean it's a good thing. Um, but I don't think that there should be a panic or, for that matter, a determinism that, oh, look at, look at, now we already know the future, right? Look at what's happening on college campuses. These are the leaders of the future. Therefore, this is the institutions of the future, yada, yada, yada. Weirdly, uh, this is still America, um, and there is still an entrepreneurial path. Um, and that includes elitism. <laughs> there are all kinds of people who have made themselves uh, into elite uh, in unconventional ways. One person we said we weren't going to talk about uh, who has not succeeded, um, but you could see maybe if he were of a slightly different disposition, he could have, would be someone like Kanye West, right? Uh, he had an audience with the former president uh, in, the, in the, the Oval Office, right? I mean, this is someone... You know, for for many reasons we don't need to get into, uh, doesn't have a lot of credibility, uh, and yet went from nothing to something, um, and that does still happen in the United States, uh, for better or worse. Uh, but I don't think just looking at who is going to Yale uh, is going to be the crystal ball uh, that lets us know what our political and other you know social future are in the country. Um, I think that there there's more to it than that. One of the things, when Thomas Jefferson founded the University of Virginia, his thought for the ideal would be that 1 percent of the general population would attend college. That 1 percent was never envisioned to be representative. 
Um, we also have a time in this country where fewer and fewer people are in college. For the first time in a very long time, we're seeing a contraction of people going to college. So the question, the question is, 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 one, should college be representative, quote unquote, um, representative not only of the sort of, you know, uh, Title IX categories we think about or representative in the sort of, um, you know, ideological sense. Um, most college undergraduates now are also female. Um, the college, the college population is not and has not ever been representative of the United States. So the, you know, whether this should be concerning or not, I think has to be, has to come down to more the level of what is it, you know, we have now an unprecedented sort of college debt crisis. How many of these people are going to be materially worse off? from going into college. The path to from college to wealth to influence is not as clear as it's always been. And um, and I think, you know, while this while this brings up a lot of interesting questions, one of the things that I'm always curious when conservatives say college is ter you know, there's the old joke of the two old ladies who are at the deli and the one goes, you know, the food here is terrible. And the other goes, I know, in such small portions. And, you know, you have on the one hand, right of center people saying these institutions are worthless, they're morally bankrupt, they're not delivering what they have traditionally promised. On the other hand, it's like, why aren't they more like us? Or why aren't there more of us in there? And I think you have to reconcile those things. And I think the, these, these preoccupations either with identity group representation or this sort of viewpoint diversity does a disservice to the real question of what colleges should be for and whether or not they're effective. The fact that they're overwhelmingly left-leaning does not in and of itself, to me, say that they're ineffective. Now, there are plenty of cases to be made that, that college is in crisis right now, but I don't think that that's what's driving it. So uh, to, get, to follow up on that um, and to take another entrepreneurial angle, I mean, you mentioned the University of Virginia was founded by... Thomas Jefferson, um, I doubt it was well-respected by Oxford graduates <laughs> uh, at the time to say whether it is now. Um, that's true of Princeton. That's true of Harvard. That's true of Yale. Um, there are people out there founding new universities or alternatives to the current high higher ed model now. If it's like any other market, which it is, uh, the vast majority will fail. That's how entrepreneurship works. But some will succeed. Um, and there will be uh, some new reorganization of the market for higher education, um, for even elite status and influence. Um, this is something that I regard as we are currently in a transition period. And it moved a lot slower than I expected it to. I thought 10 years ago we were on our way to where we are now. Uh, much quicker than it took. It took a whole global pandemic to really put some pressure on the system um, in a way that that seems to be making a real difference. Uh, so maybe it's it's just this slow motion car wreck, um, <laughs> right? Uh, but in the meantime, look around, uh, look at, at maybe some unexpected places because I think there are people who really genuinely love the liberal arts uh, and humane education who believe that human potential includes growth and knowledge and wisdom and that education has a role to play and that that is something good in itself and also useful for life. Um, and I, 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 would, I would be saddened as much as I think the current model uh, needs reform. I would be saddened if it all went away. It would be a tragedy if it all went away. Um, and thankfully, I've seen at least some people out there trying to do something new. Um, and I would say look for those things as well. You can look at schools that are now considered within the pantheon of the Ivy Leagues, or at least Ivy League adjacent places like Dartmouth comes to mind, that 
largely were created because people at the time thought places like Harvard and Yale had gone off the rails in uh, their own way. So I, I, I agree with you. I, I always thought one of the things that was interesting to me about this University of Austin project is, you know, I in the same entrepreneurial way, I appreciate the idea of competition. The question that I've always had is about the long run commitment to the project. That's what I wonder the most about because – I think you're right. I mean, the in the same way you can't have um, a, a new old friend, you can't have a new old institution. And if you are just you know, a family from Oklahoma and you're today given the choice of your child has an opportunity to go to Harvard or to go to the University of Austin, you're probably going to pick Harvard because there is the obvious brand promise implicit in having gone to Harvard. Um, I At one point... A number of years ago, I'm trying to decide if I you know, liked the direction that my professional career had taken. I went through this whole, like, maybe I should take the LSAT. I should go to law school. It's still not too late to do that. And I talked to some friends uh, who had done it. I talked to one person who went to Harvard Law School. She doesn't practice, um, but she went to Harvard Law School. And another person who went to Southern Illinois University at Carbondale. And I, what I thought was interesting to take away from that is at least from the, the, the law perspective, once you pass the bar, it really doesn't matter where you got your law degree from. The only thing that does matter is if you have a desire to argue cases in front of the Supreme Court or to perhaps one day sit on the Supreme Court, you better have gone to Harvard, Yale, Columbia, maybe. And now, thanks to Amy Coney Barrett, we can add the University of Notre Dame. Uh, to get access to those top elite institutions, there are other elite paths that you do need to pursue. But you can have, again, a good career as a lawyer having gone to any law school as long as you are capable, past the bar, and are able to bear that out in your professional work. Um, so I think the the other interesting thing too is the, I agree, I agree with Dan's point that, you know, the idea that it was ever supposed to be representative is is incorrect. And um, there is also, uh, you, we'd mentioned again, we said we weren't going to talk about Kanye West, but I'm going to bring him up again. What I find fascinating is that exactly what you pointed out, Dan, that you have this interesting enviousness amongst people on the right of the things that they condemn, that they, are, they condemn higher education, the problems in higher education, and as you said, are really, you know, then kind of on the, in the next breath, they're like, and why aren't they more like us? It's the same thing with celebrity. You condemn Hollywood for being corrupt and celebrities for being um, morally licentious. And the, the moment somebody with fame and popularity expresses some ideas that overlap in the Venn diagram between, you know, the, the, the right and the celebrities thinking they all lose their minds over it, which is why you get, you know, the Scott Bayo speaking at CPAC and things like that, or in this, again, this obsession over Kanye West. Um, so I, 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 I do think that it does speak to an understanding that there is, even amongst the people who are the most critical, the ones offering ideas like we should uh, tax or seize the endowments of places like Harvard. There is a recognition there of those people, again, of the value of those institutions and why they exist. I still think, and I know I've said this before and I'll say it again, one of our biggest problems when it comes to all of this is the early emphasis to students, young students, on the idea of, you know, you graduate from high school and then you go to college. And that is just to me a very easy way that we could back off of the how seemingly important a lot of this stuff is, is by de-emphasizing the necessity, at least of doing that immediately out of high school. And one of one of my good friends did that immediately out of high school at the same university that I went to and dropped out after his uh, the first semester of his, of his sophomore year. And three or four years later, went back uh, to a different school, got an undergraduate degree, Ended up going to Cal Arts, and he's now um, uh, working slash teaching uh, at a – I can't remember the name of it, but it's like the Harvard of Japan, right? 
needed some time in order to be able to figure out what it was that he really wanted to do and to figure out how higher education could potentially be of value in the pursuit of those goals. And for the people that look at it largely for the economic benefit of it, the idea that, you know, there's, again, selection bias, pro- pro- selection bias problems with a lot of this as well, um, the earning potential that you have over the person who doesn't go to college if you, if you do go to college, um, there's about an equal economic benefit from getting married. We also don't emphasize that. Uh, but we do emphasize this some incredible. People some people do. <laughs> you are absolutely correct. But it is not emphasized by and large in the same way that incredibly important to go to college, and the marriage point is just kind so of set I'll, aside. I'll actually push back a little bit, but not like I. I was. I had the same experience. Um, weirdly, given how not great my high school was, uh, you know, graduate, go to college, whatever. Although there was go to community college, which was very good advice. It turned out, um, but. Uh, about 10 years ago, uh, I was following a lot more generational demographics, and I remember a lot of headlines coming out of Pew or whatever saying, you know, millennials are now the most educated generation in American history. Um, and the data point was something like 34% of millennials had a college degree, which meant that 66% did not. The vast majority did not have a college degree. And yet the assumption was a millennial is someone with a college degree. I mean, that was the takeaway that all the, not to blame Pew, but, you know, any of the major news outlets were taking away from it. Um, And that's kind of bizarre to me. There's a lot of places where, you know, it's probably especially rural, um, where people go to school and unless they are the A student, they are not encouraged to go to college, but they are encouraged to get married. Um, and I think I think some marriage stats might back me up on that, um, although I'd have to look into it because I haven't recently. But there is a different path. There are other paths, at least, um, to a good life, uh, economically speaking. And a lot of it is about the foundation you build upon. In some cases, yes, a college degree can can be part of that foundation, but it doesn't have to be. I think there's also a very interesting, um, and I'm not, I'm not suggesting you're doing it, but it just exists in these conversations, what I think is a bit of rhetorical sleight of hand as well that speaks to our understanding of how well these institutes of higher education are actually doing their job. The way that that's phrased, right, that this the millennials are the most educated. Mm-hmm. I'd argue they're the most schooled. Yeah. yeah. I don't know that they're the most educated. Yep. Um, because there's this presupposition that – if you've gone through and you've received the certificate that you've received an education, you've, you've checked certain boxes to be able to receive a piece of paper that says we you know, now confer upon you this degree. Um, I've known plenty of people who are uh, educated, well-educated people who do not have a college degree and plenty of people with advanced degrees uh, who I definitely would not describe as well-educated. Just just one one last thing on this representative question, and, and I'm totally biased on this question as an alumni, but I think one of the finest undergraduate institutions in the United States is Hillsdale College. And this gets borne out in those sort of top 100 lists that come out every year. Hillsdale always shows up near the top. Hillsdale does not have any viewpoint diversity in this sort of statistical sense that, you know, it's broken down in here. It is overwhelmingly a right-leaning student population. It is overwhelmingly sort of the opposite of a lot of these trends we see long we see along other lines. And yet to my mind, the sort of classical liberal arts tradition, it's one of the very best institutions in embodying those things in a way forward. So I think, you know, w- one of the things you have to recenter both the conversation about the differences between education and schooling. And the differences between, um, you know, the crisis in education and how does it relate to these, you know, whether or not it's representative. I think those are very separate questions. And I think there is a really great arbitrage opportunity here for folks that Hillsdale at Hillsdale College has seized. Um, they have, you know, a nearly billion dollar endowment, which Hopefully, Josh Hammer will not seize. But, (laughs) like, you know, this is possible. It is possible to have a different sort of education system. And I think if 
if you're if your pushback on what it is going to be today is that it's not representative, I think you're going to miss those opportunities. Let's call it a wrap there. I want to thank you for listening to Act and Unwind. If you're listening to this podcast on our website, please take a look right now in the show notes where you will find a link where you can subscribe directly to Act and Unwind or just search Act and Unwind on your favorite podcast app. Also, please rate and review us on Apple Podcasts, five-star reviews only, so that more people can find this program. Thanks to Dylan. Thanks to Dan. For the Acton Institute, I'm Eric Cohn. We'll see you next week.